Hello, it gives me a great pleasure to present this lecture in a reasonably unusual mode for me. Thanks uh, heaps to Wyan and the organizers of the uh, Interdisciplinary Perspective on Language Health and Wellbeing Symposium. And uh, we will just hope it all goes well. Uh, okay. Uh, Right, so uh, once again, thanks again. Thanks for uh, being here with me and I look forward to the Q&A session. So the languages of well-being, a view from the Pacific. Preamble, uh, what's the point of what I'm going to say uh, is, well, here it is, ways of talking about diseases, ailments, convalescence and well-being vary from language to language. And in some languages, you just have very peculiar ways of saying things. An ailment may hit or get the person. In other languages, a sufferer will catch an ailment, just like in English, I suppose. It can be accompanied by it, or is presented as a fighter or a battleground. All of you who know the work, the work by Susan Zontag know all the interesting repercussions of it. So the question is, how does language, and more specifically, the grammatical means it employs, reflect conceptualization and perceptions of disease, then of course, its cure, prevention, consequences, and uh, its place in the society? A very big question. Our focus will be much uh, more narrow. I will just focus on languages from uh, a hotspot, at least one of the hotspots of linguistic diversity and infectious diseases. Originally, I was concentrating on Amazonia and New Guinea, but here, of course, being the Pacific, let's just focus on New Guinea, which will give some interesting uh, results, I hope. So the premise is every language will have a variety of means for talking about diseases and ailments. And uh, uh, the ways in which disease, ailment, recovery, and well-being in general are conceptualized across languages and cultures will somehow be reflected in grammatical patterns used not just in words uh, people use to talk about these phenomena. And they tend to be expressed during using different grammatical schemas. And these grammatical schemas actually may change as languages may change. So, uh, we will focus on a few, uh, not all, but uh, most pervasive, most frequently encountered by me, shall we say, grammatical means of talking about various phases of disease and sickness across the languages of the world and how they may correlate with the way people perceive the disease and uh, conceptualize it. Well, you all recognize Nick Enfield, who is, uh, I think, uh, classic uh, in the Australian context and world context. And let me just quote, it's a lovely quote, encoded in the semantics of grammar, we find cultural values and ideas and clues about social structures and people's attitudes. So that's my major premise. Uh, we'll start with a brief taxonomy of grammatical schemas and means employed across the languages of the world, focus on the languages of the Pacific. That will be my point too. And there is a little bit more on that in some uh, uh, stuff uh, which is quoted here. So a number of special features of these schemas point towards something when I started working on that uh, was a little bit unexpected for me. The existence of a grammar of well-being, so special means used for the expression of well-being, which stand apart from superficially similar constructions used under different circumstances. My point three. Point four, different stages of disease its onset progression, wearing off recovery and cure, you see why being a little bit optimistic, death of course as well maybe, form the trajectory of well-being, which is again reflected in different grammatical schemas. This will touch on it just very briefly in point four. Now, a most important point, can we uncover the motivations for the use of any of the schemas and the traditional ways of talking about disease or actually not talking about it? And it's pretty obvious, everyone will say that, look, lexicon or vocabulary, wouldn't it be another obvious place to look for patterns of conceptualization of disease? Yes, and we'll get back to it a little bit in point six. And way of speaking uh, about diseases, nature, treatments, uh, shift under the influence of mainstream cultures and national languages. Well, ways of speaking may superficially change. Now, whether the underlying concept change or not, it's a question that We'll just throw into the public, topic of point seven. And the very last point, 
In addition to all that, social upheavals and pandemics often see the emergence just of new ways of talking about new afflictions. We know that COVID-19 has affected a few languages, creating new words and new patterns. Well, I've just been working on an Amazonian language where ways of talking about COVID-19 is way different from any other uh, affliction. Now, can we in the Pacific, within Papua New Guinea, can we discern any incipient patterns? Can, be, can they be explained? This is what we turn to in point eight. And after that, there'll be a few take home points. Hopefully uh, they won't make your bags where you put all these points too heavy. Now let's start with the taxonomy of grammatical schemes, uh, schemas in describing disease. So first of all, just one thing needs to be taken, get, uh, to get it out of the way. The expressions of diseases, of course, may belong to a variety of word classes. Uh, Michael Halliday uh, did a, a wonderful job for English. We have adjectives like an English sick. No one, uh, a horn finisterra language from Morobe province, him, sick and so on. Uh, they can be verbs like in Mana Mugabi, Beel is a verb, or they can consist of a copula plus an adjective, as again in Manambu, in, sorry, English, be sick, or Manambu, as again, qua, be, uh, have cold like, stay cold like, or as you'll see. Nouns, English fever, tuberculosis, Manambu, uh, bar, malaria, fever, or disease, and that in two languages, Soskundi, Yalago, Boykin, and Ambulas or different diseases and ailments can be expressed by members of different word classes. For instance, in Manambu, Hindu language, from the Sipic province, the generic term be sick is a verb terms for symptoms are nouns. Now, uh, there may be something very important behind it. I now am throwing it at you as a fact. Cross-linguistically, the point is that these terms occur in different grammatical schemas. Now, what the hell are grammatical schemas? Well, Point one, uh, ways of talking about the basic experiences of uh, ailments, disease, various stages of recovery or maybe death, who knows, well-being, involve a number of conventionalized syntactic patterns. And these patterns are called grammatical schemas. The term was introduced uh, earlier than Ben Heine's work, but Ben Heine, whom you can see here presenting actually on something else, on grammaticalization, another era of his, was the one who really formulated it well. So here are some references. And uh, uh, the recurrent, for instance, the recurrent patterns of predicative possessive expressions can be accounted for by a number of grammatical schemas. Action, for instance, action, I have something, or I hold something, location, something is on me, companion, I'm with something, and source, uh, it is from something. So here is the possession book you can uh, check out. Uh, in other words, a schema will reflect significant attributes abstracted from a number of conceptually related events. It's a sort of generalized construal uh, of recurrent events, schemes, scenes, or situations. And it's uh, Shibatani, Mat Shibatani, you can see his picture here, another cl cons uh, modern classic, uh, basically uh, describes these schemas as conceptual archetypes, archetypes, sorry, grounded in the experiential domain. So we are talking about these grammatical uh, abstractions, which reflect something. Now, we'll see what they reflect later on. So our taxonomy of grammatical schemas in describing disease. We've been working on it we, because there's a whole project team since uh, mid-2018. Uh, it's based on the analysis of grammars and materials on about 300 languages. In fact, it's growing from different parts of the world and especially those I did or continue doing field work on myself and discussed in the framework of basic linguistic theory principles are in, the lingu uh, in this handbook uh, of linguistic typology. If you would like a copy of it electronically or some other way, just write to me. I will uh, obviously be very happy to share. Now, let's start. The predication schema A the disease is in the predicate slot of an intransitive clause. You have A, I, A1, a Roman one state, like English, I am sick or I am feverish, or Bola, uh, um, Bola, I suppose, an oceanic language from New Britain, co courtesy of uh, René Vandenberg, another kind of modern classic who is working on many, many oceanic languages from PNG. I am sick, you can see example one. Predication schema from Manambu is uh, two. Let me read it to you. Given back. Uh, if we are sick, so the word be sick, we eat ginger. Well, really, I think ginger will make you recover. It's very, very hot. So anyway, you try one day. Uh, 
and uh, a, a, a uh, uh, Roman II process, English, I got sick, I became sick. Here is an example from another language, Ambulas or Abelam. He got sick. It's a language uh, famous by the work of Antony Forge, who was, uh, well, he was a fantastic classic of anthropology. I missed him, never met him. Uh, uh, an example from Manambu, here is Lindsay Kamimbao from Avatip saying, uh, I got sick with symptoms of a cold. Asigi kanawon. The motion schema, where the disease is the subject of a motion verb, the sufferer is a goal of a destination. It's like disease comes onto X or to X. Here is exa an example from Fuyug, so that sickness came, from, uh, came upon Ilitumen, Ilit Tumon, sorry, by Rob Bradshaw, who is doing a PhD with us, a, a very promising uh, scholar. And uh, here is a motion schema from Karawari, because you see, I will be veering you towards the area I've been working on for the last 25 years, which is the Pacific area of New Guinea. So don't be surprised that you will get lots of those, where you say, Mari ama wapai kan, I'm getting sick. Sick and sickness come or comes on me. And here is a group of uh, Karawari speakers I befriended in WeWork. Possession schema. Here, but a predicative possessive construction is deployed to express the affliction. Now, there are eight schemas in the expression of predicative possession, in, uh, Ben Ayn has discovered. Uh, the most recurrent ones are the have schema, the existence schema, and the accompanied schema. Here is the have schema, which is what we all say as soon as we start sneezing, we say, I have a cold. Or if you want to speak Tokpisian, which is uh, the major lingua franca, or uh, one of the uh, several national languages of Papua New Guinea, you say, me got sick. The have schema is also found in indigenous languages of the Sipic. So in Yatmul, which is a language which every anthropologist will die for because it's Gregory Bateson made it famous, you say, Yalakwanatima, uh, are you sick or are you having a disease? Uh, the existence schema is just, just the statement of an existence of an affliction. You find it in Gadzup, which is one of the most interesting languages from around where Karampa is, Kanyanto Goroka, lots of tones, which is why Rene decided not to mark them. She got a disease. Her disease is the accompanying schema, which is a very prominent feature in many languages. Here, uh, the, I mean, the possessi is presented as a companion to the subject, just out of, you know, uh, Bill Foley has done great work on Yimas, and here is an example from Yimas, I am sick, I am with sickness, and of course, Karawari from Borotelban, they're very closely related, Min Mari Nandikin, uh, she sickness with. And each of these possession schemas, I also used to express possession constructions, uh, uh, possession of other items. I want you want to say, I have a house, I have told the sister, you will do it in the same way. But expressions like the ones you've seen and also have actually, and I have a cold in England, in English, sorry, tend to behave differently from normal or more prototypical possessive constructions. For instance, in English, one can use belong to refer to a house, but you wouldn't say that uh, to refer to a cold. You'd say, I have a cold, but cold belongs to me now. And in English, Tokpis and Yatmul and, uh, uh, well, other languages, which should be sort of uh, three dots here, a possess-oriented question sounds weird. You would never ask, and whose cold is it? Just, just you wouldn't, it would be stupid. I tried actually, people said, what, what, Sasha, you'd pick Tokpis and what? How, what do you want to say? Now, actually, uh, schema D, the acquisition schema with agentive sufferer. Within this schema, a transitive clause where the sufferer is the subject and the disease of the, uh, is the object, we get examples like English, I caught a cold, he got malaria, caught a cold, and you get 10 from Tokpisian, Amy kissing malaria, and 11 from Amelie Gum family from Madang. It's a great grammar by uh, Roberts. Now, what about the disease here? Is it a true object? Probably not. Because even in English, you say, I caught a cold. You probably wouldn't say, I caught it. I caught it. It's it, a fish, yes, but not a cold. Or you probably wouldn't question, what did you catch? And you can't pacifize it. You can't say, a cold was caught by me. No. And here is an aside for you. In many European languages, including English, uh, French, and others, the sufferer of a disease appears with these transitive clauses. The sufferer fights or battles a disease, overcomes it, or uh, succumbs to it. There are all these sort of military type actions. 
and this can be considered an uh, interesting peculiar variation on the schema, the schema, the, the acquisition uh, schema with the gentle sufferer. This pattern is hardly attested outside Europe, which is why I said it's peculiar. And at the very end of the presentation, I included an uh, envoi where you can just have a look at the origins of it. They lie in the uh, sort of militaristic uh, language, kind of language and culture co-development in France. Uh, due to Louis Pasteur. So it's more than just the invention of great uh, medical things that we owe to Louis Pasteur. Now let's go on the acquisition E, the acquisition schema with agentive disease. That's the opposite of D. It's represented by a transitive clause where the disease is the transitive subject, the suffering is the object. So the disease is doing the affecting, getting people, taking them, hitting them. And this schema is incredibly common across the languages of New Guinea. Look at mana books. I had more examples, but it just one will be enough and we'll play with it. He got malaria, malaria and the gamkorel, poor boy. Now, uh, he, malaria caught him, but malaria is a she. If you have questions about gender in mana books, it's a whole new story, a different topic, and we can get to it. But in this case, you can see that malaria definitely is a subject. And here is the poor thing that was got by malaria. The acquisition schema with the genital disease, another example from Karawari, you say he's sick, and actually, in fact, sickness got hold of him. And variations on the verb of effect, and God's a disease hits the person, and we'll see something very similar in Manambu. And in Manambu disease, especially sort of when you feel this kind of, you know, unpleasant biting uh, uh, feeling, it bites a person. I got such an example. Uh, one of my sisters, because I'm adopted into the community, said, I'm tired. I'm tired because cold, which is cough and sneeze, basically, bites me a lot. And this is not uh, exotic. Disease can bite a person in other languages. We have lovely examples from Dearbell, an Australian language Bob Dixon shared with us in 2019. The word bajan, bite. And also other agentive schemas, such as uh, disease agentive schemas, bind up tightly and catch, got ho uh, hold of or grab. Toothache is biting me. I'm exposed to some durable speaker, so I can sort of dare pronounce it. But uh, it's not only toothache, which is supposed to be some kind of grubs biting into gums, but also rheumatism and paralysis. It's all sort of biting, but it's just a, it's agentive of different sorts. And the gentive disease scheme and topician is very, very widespread. So you say 16 sick, ikisime, illness got him, or he or she got sick. You can sick a holy man, sickness holds him, he's sick, or she's sick, sickness binds him, or sickness overcomes him, he's very sick. It's almost like sickness uh, wins over him. So the opposite of a uh, uh, sufferer succumbs to a sickness, and his sickness down him, man, gets him down. Now, what about the disease? What is it doing here syntactically? Is it a true subject? No, it is not. Actually, I wouldn't be asking if it, uh, uh, such a question if the answer were simple. It's not. It cannot be questioned. So who, what caught him? You just don't do it. I mean, you can ask this question. People say, Sasha, what do you want to say? The sufferer also doesn't uh, have all the object properties. It's weird to ask, whom did malaria get? I tried, because there was a bit of a spread of malaria. I said, whom did it get? I said, what? Uh, you say it differently. You say, how are people feeling or how are they? Now, next schema is the malefactive schema, which is a copy of a verbless clause with the suffering and the subject function and disease marked with a particular malefactive case. Frankly, I only found an example from Manambu, but I'm sure there are more. It's quite uh, nice. I mean, it's, it's quite sort of fits in with the grammar of the language. 20. Le barakwal. She has fever, or she's sick, or she has become sick. Basically, it means she stays because of the detrimental effect of fever. The disease is presented, uh, is presented as a detrimental entity and has the function of a copula complement. The copula can be emitted, which basically uh, happens in other sort of descriptions of bodily state. Uh, and the copula complement cannot be questioned. In other cases, it can be questioned. So that's a special feature. We also have the topic schema. 
Here the sufferer is presented as a clausal topic and the clause initial position with the disease being the subject of the subsequent clause. You'll catch me out on that because in fact, who is the subject will get to it. It's a widespread feature of many languages of the mainland Southeast Asia and the Pacific. It's a beautiful work by Mary Beth Clark, which I strongly recommend. Many people remember, still remember her, they knew. Here is an example from Mandarin Chinese, won't they read it? Zhang San, very headache, means meaning Zhang San has a severe headache. Manambu has heaps of it and other related languages as well. You'd say, Ndeyaparel, he has asthma or heart attack, we'll get back to it. Basically what it says is he bre breath goes up, but he is masculine and uh, asthma is feminine, as you can see. So who is the subject here? So what's topic, special about the topic schema? Well, first of all, inalienable part, uh, whole relationship between the sufferer and the affected part. So, uh, uh, Chan had a headache, it's head is part of him. And in Mandarin Chinese, uh, Lu Yongshan, who is, I think, is a, one of the best scholars of Mandarin Chinese, he's in Melbourne, uh, not in a lockdown anymore, thank goodness. Uh, so you can ask him, both the topicalized constituent, the sufferer and the part, who's sick, have a full set of subject properties. You have these double subject constructions that people are suffering from because they're difficult to analyze. In Manambu, you have seen that the affected body part triggers feminine agreement on the predicate. So it is the subject. But then what about him? Is he not the subject? Well, I would say no, maybe it is. It is the sufferer actually that will trigger the same subject switch reference marking within the closed chain. We see it in 23. It's in the Yabar and he died of asthma. He, uh, what it says, he, breath having gone up, same subject, died. So he died and, well, you can see again, there is something special about these constructions, only these, not necessarily other body part construction. So the construction evolving disease is special. Also a further feature which sets the expression involving a topic schema apart from others is the application of contents question. We just cannot uh, question the body part in 22. I cannot say, he, what went up? It just would make no sense. What you can say is, how is he? And da, 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 how is he? What's the matter with him? Now, evidence for special grammar of well-being. Well, you've already seen, you already feel what I'm kind of driving at. A number of special features of these schemes point toward the existence of a grammar of well-being. They stand apart from superficially similar constructions used under different circumstances. Constructions in C possession schema behave differently from possessive constructions. One can have a disease, but disease would not belong to one. You cannot say whose disease or whose cold it is. The agentive, uh, in the agentive schema of agenta, the acquisition schema of agentive sufferer, the disease is really not a true object because you would not say, I caught a cold, you would not say I caught it, or you would not question it. And you can't pacifize on it. The acquisition schema with agentive disease, uh, like Siki Kisimem in Tokpisian, disease is not a true subject. It cannot be questioned, and the sufferer doesn't have all the true properties of an object. You wouldn't say whom did malaria get. So special features like that point toward the reality of a special grammar of well-being. Recurrent and language-specific features are an avenue for further research because it really involves uh, in-depth analysis of each language. But I think we are towards moving towards something interesting. The trajectory of well-being. Basically the choice, you probably already felt that, of a grammatical schema may correlate with different stages of well-being, including the onset of disease and the state of illness. For instance, the motion schema is like disease is coming onto you. So it's acquisition of disease and predication schema is used or maybe used for a statement on disease. So in Manambu, acquisition schema, malaria gets, gets him. It's the onset of disease. Once the disease has taken hold, you may have predication schema or most frequently in sort of the normal usage, you will use the manufactured schema. Lebaricuan, she's become sick, stays because of the detrimental effect of sickness or fever. Now, grammatical schemas and uh, their correlations with the stages of well-being are shown here. So you can see onset is uh, in, most, in many, many languages, like the majority of what I've seen, uh, are realized through A, B, D, O, E, O, G. State of disease can be topic or predication state, possession or malefactive schema. 
And the trajectory of well-being would, of course, include onset of disease, disease setting in, disease on the way, the patient recuperating or not, actually. And, of course, the role of entities at every stage, inflicting disease and of healing and the role of healing specialists. And this is what we'll get to now. The trajectory of well-being is a big ent uh, enterprise. I did it for the Amazonian language I'm working on now and Tariana and um, using on day-to-day -day basis because all we talk about now with the people is uh, who is sick. And uh, it would be interesting to do a more general study. I'm sure. Now, let's get to a question why motivations for the use of grammatical schemas. Can we uncover the motivations for why some schemas are used? Maybe it's somehow grounded in the traditional ways of thinking of or thinking or talking. So we can see about disease and healing. Can we dis discern the cognitive and the attitudinal underpinnings, patterns of conceptualizations? Okay, we'll try. Not sure. I, I hope I'll be convincing. Start with some relevant points. In all societies, a disease is considered a disturbance to the order of things everywhere, here as well. In many indigenous societies, especially in the Pacific and in New Guinea, its emergence is associated with social imbalance or imbalance created by a breach of custom. We did something wrong. This is why uh, everyone is sick. And uh, a disease may acquire its own agency or there may be someone else behind it. Uh, let's get to the category of the sick. Well, well, the sickness or an unusual bodily state, somebody's sick or they're sweating or there's some symptoms which are not right, is manifested through the impairment of their normal kai, way of life, custom, manner, law, ritual. A person is breathing strangely, they cannot perform their usual activities. The person is then said to be with sickness. Remember, possessive accompaniment schema, C3. Minmari, Ngadikin, Ngadikin. And this is explained by people to, uh, to borrow Telban, not just that ah, a person has sickness. Sickness becomes embodied within the person. The scheme is interesting because it appears to iconically correlate with the traditional healing practices, as borrow Telban describes it. The specialist tries to find the cause and remove the embodiment, the physical embodiment of the sickness, which can be a stone or a needle, anything. And uh, 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 basically what we have is that once the disease has set in, it has taken hold of a person. Again, we saw that in the agentive, uh, in the acquisition schema with agentive disease, he's sick. Menmarayan uh, Sarinyan, sickness got hold of him. The disease acquires its own agency or someone else is behind it. Now, whose agency is that? You will see in a few minutes that certain questions you can't ask or you will ask but people just will look at you blankly let me give an example from my field work a man and a woman there are certain things women are not allowed even a white woman who is a bit of a sort of monster uh, uh, are not allowed to see there is a forbidden flute which used to belong to women and then was taken uh, from women by men as a symbol of power now they can hear it and they have to run away if they catch a glimpse of this flute they will develop an eye disease and will eventually get blind. We had a blind woman in the village, another tip, and uh, that's how it was explained. 24. After the spirit, who is called Dakul, uh, hit her, she lost eyesight. And all I can take picture of being, I mean, just a curious sort of person, okay, I could take the picture of, a, of where Dakul was hidden. So we, all, we can look at it, fine, we won't get blind. Anyway, maybe, of course, I have to have stronger glasses to uh, look inside, or maybe I shouldn't. And this is your schema E, agentive disease in action. There is a spiritual entity that inflicts an adverse state by doing what? Hitting one. A very similar pattern in many areas across the basin of the mighty Sipic. And this is a picture from the plane. That's what it looks like. The Kwama of the Sipic, again, they're all my relatives, so here is a picture. Take the view that the only reason a person becomes ill is because of someone bears a grudge against them and does something. There are ways of uh, 
putting it, people say uh, phrasing it, putting germs in his body, maybe they do it for an anthropologist to understand, or by inflicting a, pa a, a patient with kappa, which is white pow powder, I saw a little bit of it. It's believed to be made from ground up human skulls, but nobody knows. In actual fact, that's agency behind it. So the disease or a disease does not come up by, by itself. There's a hidden agency behind it. And the agency is linked to something. Basically, we can say shamanic attacks or the dreaded sanguma, a malevolent magic influence throughout the Sipic region feared all across Papua New Guinea. There are some uh, uh, references. It's very similar to many other uh, here, areas in the Pacific, my uh, all-time favorite is uh, Janice Reed's 1983 book about the Yongo. You probably all know it. So, uh, uh, we appear to be facing an instance of iconic motivation for an acquisition schema with a genetic disease to express the agency of an affliction. Very good. Now, who does it? Can we ask? And this is where the conspiracy of silence comes in how to talk about the disease and what causes it. A sort of quick uh, 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 response, don't ask, don't name it. Stigma associated with naming diseases and being precise about nature of an, uh, an affliction impinges on ways of talking about disease and, the, and labeling and classification of afflictions. A beautiful example from Kwayo, an oceanic language from the Solomons, comes from uh, work by Fifi, uh, uh, Roger, the late Roger Kissing and Fifi, where the terms shu, leprosy, and phonomela, which is a disease category partly overlapping with tuberculosis, are restricted in use because people are afraid of contagion. You get contagion just mentioning it. And uh, especially in dwelling houses, uh, euphemisms, uh, euphemisms or alternative terms must be used. And even those terms are known to have been discarded because we get avoidance, we get taboo. And then of course your classic Allen and Byridge 2006 come into kind of spotlight because uh, people just avoid uh, mentioning these things. Result? vagueness in referring to actual disease. Well, there is often a wide range of terms reflecting symptoms, uh, sneezing or coughing or uh, having some itchy feelings, fine. But there tends to be just one uh, general way of talking about being sick, one or two, but very limited ones. So in Manam Bombar, or if you take a case mark after, put a case mark after the bare, as in 20, may refer to any ailment, ailment. So qual, it could be anything. She's just inc incapacitated. We don't want to specify. And we find similar phenomenon in Tokpisan to refer to something particularly unpleasant, dangerous disease. You'd say you would use sick or sick no good, bad disease. It covers anything from HIV AIDS to tuberculosis and possibly will, <laughs> will extend to COVID-19. Thank goodness there is not enough information on COVID-19. And in Manambu, uh, a wide range of afflictions from breathlessness to pneumonia, asthma, heart attack is covered by this yap as we saw in 22. The yap warel can mean heart attack, asthma, just uh, choking on something, losing breath. So very non-specific. So how to name the agentive entity behind the disease? Well, restrictions, basically don't name it. So among the Karawari, the words associated with those spirits who actually inflict diseases, uh, like Sakima, uh, feminine spirit, and Wundumbunar, masculine spirit, are normally not mentioned. In Manambu, such things are whispered over here. What they say. They're whispered, which is why it's very difficult to, it's difficult, you can't ask it about this information. You should sit it and buy it, but very often you can't hear what's happening. And Manambu word why Sangoma black magic is very rarely used. You use other words, which are like euphemism, yano, which is a magic, which is just sort of talking in a magic way, including a prayer nowadays, or yin and yinjap, a uh, thing one rubs in. Yano sepundu will be a sort of magic way speaking man. You can say bad bird, kopra pravapi, or pisin no good, you can say, to pisin form, or you can say something else. You can uh, use the word for a biggish black mosquito. As you all know, the Sipic area is really one of the world's capitals of mosquito, mosquito-borne diseases. Maybe its rival is Southern Amazon, if I haven't tried. What mosquitoes normally do is bite. And one of the speakers, I was sitting, uh, you know, the house just itching. I don't like these mosquitoes. And Rex Cavindu, my brother, said, oh, well, guess their job. Yeah, this is what they do. They bite. It's their job. But 
if presented as a euphemism for an agent of disease or death, they hit. So we had a little boy who passed away and we sort of been watching, we're sitting in the house watching the funeral. And as I asked my sister, um, why, why did he buy? And she said, whispering, black mosquitoes hit him. It's very similar to the spirit that women cannot see in 24. After the spirit in dark will hit her, she lost eyesight. Via, the verb to hit, is also used for wind blowing, any sort of, it doesn't have to be bad, but it sort of hits you, it affects you somehow. And we'll see something else in section eight. Now, what happens when languages come in contact with each other? Well, uh, with regard to introduced and diagnosed diseases, those diseases are specified using loans. So you can use malaria now. Malaria, is, it still doesn't mean it's malaria. It could be any uh, disease which is uh, feverish. But the point is that you still have the same schema, which is agentive disease, as in 12. Uh, and it's a disease you take malarone for. Now, uh, the interesting point that you do find uh, shifts to contact-induced schema. So in 26, this little girl in the yellow shirt, Jemima, Jem Jemima, not Jemima as has pronounced, said, oh, why is uh, the little brother sort of who is off uh, the screen? Uh, so so uh, kind of said, ah, he got malaria. So what? Malaria, not malaria, got him, he got malaria. Jemima speaks, Jemima speaks Tokpisian most of the time, and it is a Tokpisian form used now and again. Jamie and Manambu uh, is affected by Tokpisian, such as Mikisi malaria, and of course, PNG, uh, English taught at school. So it's just this calc. Now, the way of speaking change. What about the concepts? Well, that's for us to live and see. And in addition to that, social upheavals and pandemics may see the emergence of new ways of talking about new afflictions, or maybe not so new. The disease may still retain its agentility. Now, New afflictions, old patterns. I seem to be contradicting myself, but you'll see in a minute. Well, new health hazards bring about new ways of saying things. In the times of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, Australian English has seen the emergence of very interesting new words. You have ISO for isolation, quarantine times, quarantine times, God forbid we won't see them again, quarantine for mart martini drunk during the quarantine times, and COVID, uh, this sort of stupid person who just doesn't think about COVID being dangerous. There's a wonderful uh, uh, article uh, by uh, Kate Burridge and I think Herman Mans in the conversation, so there are references at the end. Or one can deploy old ways of saying things. The omni, omni, omnipresent virus, you know, who is sort of floating everywhere, especially COVID-19, has engulfed Brazil, as you know. It continues circling us. Believe it or not, it's spoken of in a manner very similar to the unending corruption, corruption within Brazilian society. Again, there is a paper you can have access to. How do the Manambu, I don't know about other people, talk about COVID-19? Well, thank goodness we haven't had any incidents of COVID-19, but many people live in Mosby and people worry, the villages or speakers of the language, some of them in big cities anyway, worry about its effect on people. And so a uh, uh, relative described it to me as a force that strikes people. So what this lady said was, most been COVID-19, COVID-19 COVID hit many people in Mosby, it hasn't hit. Okay, but you we remember the spirit in Dakul in 24 also strikes, hit. So does the mosquito, the wouldn't be, not doing its biting job, but standing in for black magic. So does the wind, is it the case that COVID-19 has its own independent agency? And that's a question which we may have an answer for, or if uh, a silver bullet and the vaccine is invented, maybe we just leave it for, for nothing. So uh, take home points, recall Nick Enfield's adage, encoded in the semantics of grammar, we find cultural values and ideas and clues about social structures and people's attitudes. Take home points, we have identified schemas A to G used in talking about well-being. Grammatical schemas differ uh, from superficially similar grammatical forms used in other contexts because there is evidence for the existence of special grammar of, of well-being. The next move would be to establish the trajectory of talking about different phases of well-being, the spread of disease, its cure, because that may shed light on the, on the way things are said and the cultural repercussions. 
And what concepts are at work behind the schemas? The acquisition schema E with an uh, agentive disease may reveal the nature of the spirit or another unspoken of entity behind it. And of course, ways of speaking about well-being of diseases correlate with fear and secrecy reflected in the lack of precision in terminology of disease, a reluctance to talk about them, is the general conspiracy of silence with regard to the ultimate cause. And uh, the ways of uh, speaking about disease change with language contact, but the interesting point is, does it mean that the concept change? That's, again, we haven't worked on it enough, but we will. A new health care hazards are talked about in new ways. COVID-19 is described by some Manabu speakers as hitting the sufferers, just like the wind, the spirit Ndaku, black magic. Or would it be the case that its uncontrollable spread imbibes it with a special a agency? Thanks so much. As they say in Manambu Nemapau, thank you, Yaramai. Here is the inscrutable CPIC for you and look forward to your questions and perhaps you'll look forward to my answers. Thank you.